Good morning, and thank you to all the educators and students joining us today for the first person interpretation of Amelia Jenks Bloomer, one of Iowa's most well known suffragists and reformers, with our speaker, Kate Lavasser. Students will enjoy a first person presentation from Amelia Bloomer, an enthusiastic temperance and women's rights reformer in the 19th century. Bloomer will share how her early reform work in New York led her to use writing as a platform for social change, dress reform, and how an introduction she made between two of her most passionate pro-suffrage friends changed the course of women's suffrage in the United States forever. She will also share her story of her family's move to Iowa and her work as president of the Iowa Women's Suffrage Society, which meant convincing anti-suffragists, both men and women, that women's suffrage would change society for the better. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this presentation on mute with cameras off. The presentation is being recorded and a link will be placed on the History Live Votes for Women webpage next week. I have disabled the chat function, but I encourage you to ask your questions using the Q&A feature. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. And now I'm happy to introduce our speaker. Kate Lavasser is a local historian who is a fifth generation Des Moines native and her love of history started at home as a child. While a history student at Drake University, she completed two internships in museum education and collections. These internships sparked an interest in educating people about history through storytelling and historic objects. She has worked at Living History Farms in Urbandale and is currently managing a museum in Des Moines and enjoys learning more about local history wherever she can. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Kate to begin the presentation. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Amelia Bloomer and today I'm here to tell you a little bit about my life as both a temperance and suffrage reformer in both New York and Iowa. I was born in Homer, New York in 1818. My parents early in their marriage had been well off but my father soon lost much of his money and the family became genteelly impoverished. Because of this, my education as a child was in local schools and I only was able to attend for a few years. I knew the value of education, however, and made it a point to read and study on my own as often as possible. As a teenager, I taught school, but for only a very short amount of time in the local schoolhouse. My older sister, Elvira, had married and moved to Waterloo, New York, and I took on the position of governess in the town of Waterloo with a wealthy family named the Chamberlains. Waterloo was the home of a very progressive group of Quakers in that time period, and many of their ideas involved equality for men and women. This particular group of Quakers really emphasized the equality for women within their communities, both in governance and in everyday life. While living with this family, I met Dexter Bloomer, who was the nephew of, the, of Mr. Chamberlain, my employer. And I got to know him over the next three years. He made it very clear that he thought of me as a very affectionate friend, However, I was a little put off initially by his uncouth manners and the fact that he drank alcohol, though in moderation. The temperance movement had started picking up speed in New York in this time period, and women became very involved in the movement as the result of a wave of religious revivalism that spread through New England in this time period. And it may seem odd that these two things are connected, but in this wave of religious revivalism, many women were called upon in congregations to help do work to increase the moral fiber of their communities in a time period when many women previously had stayed very much out of the spotlight in terms of act, taking an active role in both their church and the community. 
the idea of women as reformers took off from there. This is where my early reform activities really took off. After three years, I finally accepted Dexter and we were married in 1840. I was very devoted to the idea of equality in marriage and appreciated that Dexter was as well. In fact, at our wedding, we did not include obey in my vows, which was something that I always admired about our minister. At this point in time, I was very shy and I was also, however, very dedicated to spreading the word about temperance. My husband recognized these qualities and as he had recently purchased a newspaper, he encouraged me to write articles to spread my temperance ideas to both my community and abroad. Of course, at this time period, it was considered ungenteel and unladylike for women to give speeches. Uh, so I did most of my writing anonymously and did not do as much public speaking as I would later. It was not long after this that there was a big stir in the community of Seneca Falls where we had moved. In 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention was organized by a group of local Quaker women and a very prominent women's rights activist who had just moved into town, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Mrs. Stanton was very prominent and what had started as a, what they expected to be a small meeting uh, ended up becoming quite a large gathering, though many people just came because they were curious to see what the discussion would be. And I admit I was one of these people. The convention was held over two days. The first day was intended to be only women present, and the second day was for both men and women. I attended on the second day, and it was so crowded that I couldn't even get a seat on the main floor. One of the goals was to create a declaration of sentiments as it came to be known, where the discussion was centered around creating a document based on the Declaration of Independence that would address the areas of inequality that the women attendees felt needed to be answered and addressed. I was not in agreement with all of the things that these women were asking for. I found several of their concepts to be a little too radical and I did not sign the Declaration of Sentiments. However, I was inspired by the idea of a group of women being able to gather together and use their force for good. And in fact, that was in July of 1848. The following month in August, I, with the assistance of the other ladies in our temperance group, decided that we would create a temperance newspaper by women for women. Everyone was full of excitement when we decided on this plan, but when we started sending out for subscriptions, which would be 50 cents for a year's subscription, many people were against the idea and felt that there was no way we could succeed. Also, it was a lot of work to run a newspaper, but luckily my husband, Dexter, since he in fact was also a newspaper publisher, as you may recall, was able to help. Sadly, once we actually started the work on the paper, which was named The Lily, many of the women ended up disavowing it. So they moved away from the paper and didn't work on it. And I was basically left to run the, and pay for the whole thing myself. I ended up doing the packaging and mailing myself. So we only ended up having to pay for the paper. We ended up with several hundred subscriptions thanks to a preacher who went around selling subscriptions as he traveled around the area. Uh, but it became a place for me to share my writings on thoughts on temperance and reform with the rest of the community. Now, I said I would be talking about suffrage. And so you may be confused as to why so far that really hasn't figured into the story. 
Now, many women were working alongside men in temperance societies. In fact, many of the first temperance societies were entirely men, uh, many of whom were reformed drunkards or those who had heavily drank alcohol and used their stories of how far they had fallen uh, and the success they had in their life once they stopped drinking to encourage others to stop drinking alcohol as well. I had convinced my husband to stop drinking alcohol the winter after we got married, and I felt that this was an important change that everyone in the community needed to make in their life. However, me and other women who wanted to be involved in these organizations felt that we had been pushed down to an inferior or a second level status within the group and weren't able to enact all the reforms that we wanted to do, despite the fact that in this time period, it was viewed that women were morally superior. So it seemed to make sense that we would be able to do better work than the men in these groups. Since it was very difficult for us to get this work done, it seemed that having suffrage and pushing for women's rights was an important step in seeking the rights and reform for others. While I didn't personally meet Elizabeth Cady Stanton, during the Seneca Falls Convention or even around town as she occupied a higher social status than I did, I did eventually run into her in 1849. That year, my husband Dexter had been appointed the postmaster for our town of Seneca Falls. Since he had every confidence in my ability to help him and to hold the job myself, he actually appointed me as assistant or deputy postmaster for the town to work alongside him which was actually the, uh, the first time a woman had held a position like this in the United States. I was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the post office and actually created a room within the space that became a sort of women's lounge for town where women could come in, get caught up on the news, both of the Courier, the town's newspaper, and the Lily, my own temperance newspaper. And one day, uh, Mrs. Stanton came in and introduced herself and said that she would be interested in contributing to my paper. At that point, most of the articles and writings I had done were temperance based and Mrs. Stanton was interested in introducing more women's rights themed articles, which she would also be publishing under a pseudonym. I was a little concerned that the women's rights issues would distract from some of the temperance issues as Mrs. Stanton was known to be much more passionate and uh, more liberal on the topic than I was personally. But this was the first of many times that Mrs. Stanton and I worked together and she ended up with a regular column in the Lily starting in 1849 that fall. The paper continued to be a collaboration, though I was still the editor and still the main producer of articles. But in 1851, the paper became a platform for perhaps my most famous contribution to reform, which was a rational dress. And that sounds like a strange thing, but the idea was that the fashions of the time, which were very, very heavy, uh, you wanted to have a very uh, big skirt that was shaped like a bell, uh, meant you had to wear a lot of petticoats or kind of or skirts that you would wear under your dress to make the skirts poof out. And the amount of petticoats that you needed, which could sometimes be as many as six or eight, meant that your total outfit overall could weigh up to 15 pounds, which as you can imagine, made it very difficult to walk around and do your work around the house and your skirts were long enough that they would drag in the street and become dirty and soiled. In fact, uh, there were many cartoons at the time that were showed women just like me walking around with garbage and other uh, refuse stuck in their skirts trailing behind them. So when a cousin of Mrs. Stanton's came to town wearing a new and exciting outfit, I had to pay attention. The outfit was uh, a combination of pantaloons, which were long wide trousers that cinched at the ankles. So they narrowed down and closed at the ankle 
for modesty's sake, they were wide, as I mentioned, and then a short dress over the top. Now, a short dress here means that it was all the way up to the knees. Uh, this allowed for free movement and much less weight. And though I wrote about it before actually wearing it, I was finally challenged to wear the outfit myself. And I did, and I loved it. And it became a normal part of my everyday life as well as my reform work. Now, at this point, I had begun lecturing. While that, as I mentioned, that had not been considered appropriate earlier, by 1851, I had become famous for delivering my temperance and women's rights speeches while wearing this reform dress or rational dress. And while some accused me of using it as an, a reason to draw people in to hear what I had to say, I was okay with that because at the end of the day, what was most important was spreading my message of temperance and women's rights. However, the more popular this costume came, the more ridicule it received from both men and women who are more conservative minded about both rational dress and women's rights. After a couple of years, this led my companions, Susan B. Anthony and Liz K. Stanton to abandon the rational dress or the, what had become known as bloomers based on the fact that I made them very popular. Now, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are two names that of course in time became very closely associated. However, it was thanks to me that the two ladies met in the first place. In 1851, the same year that I brought the bloomers or the rational dress onto the more public scene, uh, Susan B. Anthony came to stay at my home uh, while we were doing some different talks and lectures about temperance because that had been Susan B. Anthony's first passion. We were taking a walk through town and we waited to cross the street uh, because Mrs. Stanton was crossing the street. I greeted her and introduced her to Susan B. Anthony and they, the two ended up forming a fast friendship based on their shared views. And later they were both known to say that this meeting changed the course of both of their lives as well as the life of suffragists across the nation. Elizabeth, Katie, Stanton and I continued to work together, but uh, of course we were not in agreement on all topics. Um, we also were kind of rivals and had a little bit of a competitive nature between the two of us. Um, Elizabeth, Katie, Stanton, especially at that time, I would say was more devoted strictly to uh, women's suffrage, whereas I was still focused very heavily on the temperance movement. And though we worked together on causes we found in common, we did have disagreements. And at one point I had even heard that Mrs. Stanton wrote a letter to Susan B. Anthony saying that uh, she needed to be careful about my suggestions because I did not have the heart of a true reformer. And this I felt was unfair, but it was uh, just an example of how our disagreement on certain topics created a bit of a, a gap between the two of us. Shortly after, in 1853, uh, my husband and I decided that we would move out west. At this point, as I mentioned earlier, many of the other suffragists had given up their rational dress uh, but I still continued to wear the bloomers that again came to be famous because of me. And I continued wearing them for several more years, both because they were practical and again, because I felt that they embodied one of the things that we were really, uh, an ideal that we were really trying to promote. We spent two years in Mount Vernon, Ohio. And at this, in this play, um, town, my husband owned the newspaper and I helped him with it. I still continued to run the Lily uh, from out West, though it became more challenging. Uh, one of the notable things that happened to us when we lived in Ohio is that we hired our first female typesetter. Uh, 
and many of the other male typesetters refused to work with her. Uh, so they quit. And of course, we just hired more female typesetters, therefore creating a great career opportunity for women in this space. After two years, we decided to move to Council Bluffs, Iowa, after my husband had visited the previous spring and just bought a small lot for us. I ended up selling the lily at this point in time uh, because in Council Bluffs, we didn't have the printing facilities and as Council Bluffs was really a frontier town at this point in time, it didn't have the mail service that we enjoyed out east that made it easier to get publications to people that had subscriptions. So the move to Council Bluffs became a very slow time for me at first when we first moved in. Uh, it was the first time in many years that I wasn't busy with my reform work and it seemed odd after this time to focus on housekeeping and getting situated. I stopped wearing my reform outfit or my bloomers at this point in time, uh, writing to a friend that it was a time I needed to settle in in a new place. And I basically wanted to blend in a little bit more. I also had had to have basically two separate wardrobes, one of the short dresses and one of the long dresses, because I would still wear the long dresses to formal events or to social gatherings, and it became expensive to maintain two separate wardrobes. Also, at this time, a new fashion had come in, the crinoline, which was kind of basically a kind of a cage that you wore under your dress to give it the shape instead of having to wear many skirts. Uh, so that made movement more easy and the clothing much lighter. So it accomplished uh, some of the same things that we are trying with the bloomers. At that point in town, uh, Council Bluffs was basically a frontier town with gambling and saloons, uh, questionable law and order. So as you can imagine, uh, I felt that there was a need for my temperance work to improve the moral character of this town. Uh, however, Despite my attempts to bring temperance into the community, it was a hard sell and both of the temperance organizations in town ended up failing relatively quickly. I did take up my pen as a way to fight for suffrage at this point in time and the letter published by the Council of Bluffs paper in 1855, so the first year that I lived there, was the first time anyone in Iowa publicly spoke out for women's rights. I did lecture as well. Uh, in fact, one of my lectures helped push a suffrage amendment and discussion in front of the Nebraska legislature, though it ultimately didn't end up passing. One of the other ways that I was supporting women's rights in this time period apart from suffrage was encouraging women's education. There were many advertisements for a girls school in St. Joseph, Missouri, but I on the other hand wrote many letters encouraging families to send their daughters to the University of Iowa. It was a co-educational facility and it was inexpensive and it was a way to ensure that women would be able to receive a, an education on par with men to encourage co-educational facilities. I also was encouraging women to buy land in Iowa. Uh, my husband ended up as a land agent in our first couple of years in Iowa. And I also did a bit of that work as well, encouraging women to buy property in Iowa and invest if they could because in Iowa, it was legal for women to own and manage their own land, uh, which was something that was out of reach for women in many other places. Once we got a little later in time, we the Civil War came and many issues arose within the women's suffrage movement. Uh, during the Civil War, I didn't do as much work uh, promoting uh, suffrage, but I did do a lot of work in the community to aid Union soldiers. And I was also um, in conversation with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton during this time period um, to support them and the women's movement in their crusade uh, against slavery. 
this had been an issue that had driven a wedge between me and some of the other suffrage ladies earlier in my life. I was ardently against slavery from my early days, uh, but I was not an abolitionist. And one area that suffragists were, well, other suffragists like Elizabeth Casey and, and uh, Susan B. Anthony uh, were very passionate about was that the Civil War needed to abolish slavery, free every slave and end the institution. And again, I was when I was against slavery, but I felt very strongly that waiting to agree on the complete abolition of slavery was not successful, would not be successful, and it would draw out the war even longer. I was against the, the institution of slavery and wanted to see it ended, but I felt personally that I was irresponsible to draw out the war, to wait for every slave to be free. And this, again, put me at odds with some of my colleagues, um, sister suffragettes, because um, we did not agree on this particular issue. After the war, my health began to decline a bit and I focused more on um, suffrage work in Iowa as opposed to on a national level, though I did still um, participate on the national level when I could. Um, I made friends in 1869 with another suffragist in Iowa who became very well known, Annie Savory. Um, we started writing to each other very often and she became interested in holding a convention for um, suffrage in Iowa and was begging for my help because she had no experience organizing uh, such a large event. My health would not permit me to travel to Des Moines, but also I was somewhat shy about visiting Annie because she was a very fancy and, and wealthy lady compared to the style that we had lived in. And this was something that I had been self-conscious about going back to my early marriage in Seneca Falls and uh, working with Mrs. Stanton, who of course was uh, of a higher social standing than I was. But finally, I met Annie Savory in person when she and her husband James traveled to Council Bluffs. Um, we became very close friends. Our visit was very successful and we set to work together. In 1870, we were able to successfully um, host a convention and actually the Des Moines, the, the government in Des Moines passed a resolution for women's suffrage. However, it would need to be approved in subsequent legislative sessions as well. Uh, so we knew that just because it had been approved once, that wasn't the solution to all of our problems. And we had a lot of fight that we needed to put forth and a lot of effort because there were not only men who were against giving us suffrage, but also women. The anti-suffragettes um, really thought that it was going to destroy the domestic life, that women were going to neglect their families, and a society would fall to ruin if women were able to vote. Uh, however, I felt that this was not the case. And around this time, one of the major divisive issues came to the forefront in our movement, which was free love. Now, the idea of free love was that women shouldn't be bound to uh, the very strict and oppressive laws that governed their lives, um, and not just women, but uh, so the idea that you should have more freedom with your rights, with your person, um, with divorce rules, so you had more rights to your children, um, that marriage wasn't a necessity. And these were all very controversial ideas and ideas that I did not support or uh, align with in any way. And unfortunately, this issue ended up completely distracting from the good work of the movement. And when it came time for our convention, Annie and I hoped to completely eliminate the issue by releasing a statement beforehand that 
this was not something that was anything to do with suffrage. We didn't support it. But during the meeting, one of our very conservative colleagues introduced a measure saying that we needed to uh, disavow or move away from this. Uh, we refused to pass that measure because we didn't feel that it was appropriate to discuss free love at our convention, which was focusing purely on women's votes. And they wouldn't have discussed this at a Republican or a Democratic uh, convention. Um, men weren't accused of having more, uh, low morality because they could vote. Um, this, so we felt that we didn't even need to discuss it and that it was inappropriate to do so. However, this got entirely twisted and uh, both Annie and I were basically pushed out of the, the movement and it was taken over by more conservative women um, who had proven uh, that they did not agree with this free love movement. And at the time I was the president of the organization. However, uh, once that term was over in 1873 and after this free love scandal, I ended up moving away uh, from publicly organized work and stayed um, more quiet and stuck with writing uh, as a way to spread my work, my ideas. Uh, and really that was how I continued my career until um, in the 1880s, I received a letter from Susan B. Anthony as she and Mrs. Stanton uh, were writing a large volume, uh, a comprehensive history of women's suffrage in the United States. And they had asked for two works, um, one that detailed my early time with, in Seneca Falls with the Lily and another about the history of suffrage in Iowa. And I ended up submitting my chapters in the 1880s and it would be another, excuse me, 1880, and it would be another seven years before it would see publication. I was mortified when it was actually published to see that um, Mrs. Stanton had heavily edited my work, had taken away some of the truths that the uh, problems that we had with the free love movement in Victoria Woodhull um, and had twisted my words or edited them to make it sound like we had not had those problems. Um, and this was still um, a wound that was not healed in Iowa uh, by 1887. So it did cause some drama uh, and people were very upset um, by the edits that Stan had made. And many thought that it was what I had written myself. Um, so I had to be very clear that 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 was not in fact what I had presented to them. On the occasion of my 50th wedding anniversary in 1890, um, I heard from Susan B. Anthony for one of the last times. Uh, she congratulated me not only for the longevity of my marriage, but also uh, holding it as proof that everything that anyone had said about um, suffrage destroying uh, traditional relationships and marriage, uh, my, that Dexter and I's relationship was proof that that was not true at all, uh, which was a sentiment that I could heartily appreciate and get behind. Soon after that, uh, my ill health continued to decline. I suffered a stroke and in 1894, I finally passed away as a result of a heart attack in Council Bluffs, Iowa, where Dexter and I were buried in the Fairview Cemetery. And that is the story of my life. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm excited to open the Q&A portion for the presentation. However, before I pose the first question, I want to remind everyone that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Uh, but please note, we may not have enough time to get all the questions, but let's go. And here's our first question. So let's start with, I think, I think the best question, how did you choose to portray Amelia Bloomer or everyone else? Well, the first two um, people that came to mind since we wanted to have an Iowa connection for this particular uh, webinar were um, Annie Savory and Amelia Bloomer, just because I was familiar with them from my own research as Iowa suffragists. And 
I really wanted to make sure that I had good content and enough content to fill the time and have it be solid information. And it wasn't that there wasn't good information about uh, Annie Savory. And obviously, um, I shouldn't say obviously, um, I talked about Annie Savory in an earlier webinar this spring. So I was definitely interested in her, but um, I actually had stumbled across an article that Louise Noun wrote about Amelia Bloomer in the Annals of Iowa in 1985. And she managed to find 90 pages worth of material on Amelia Bloomer, and it was all fascinating. Um, so that's how, why I ended up going with Amelia Bloomer uh, instead of Annie Savory. And actually to continue the talk of your research, so how did you go about your researching for this program and did you have any favorite sources? Yes, uh, that article by Louise Noun was really kind of, it was um, uh, uh, the hotbed of information, uh, especially about the time, her time in Iowa. And I would recommend it to anyone that's interested in Amelia Bloomer's biography in general, because it obviously it goes into a lot more detail about her work during the Civil War uh, than I was for, you know, giving it that for this presentation. Uh, but there's a lot of places on the internet that you can find um, information about her time, about Amelia's time in Seneca Falls, um, both for the National Archives uh, and just other, um, I mean, a Google search will take you to a lot of information about that early time. But that article by Louise Noun um, in the Annals of Iowa, which is searchable and accessible to anyone, um, was a, really the main source of information about her time in Iowa beyond um, just a, a few paragraphs about when she was president of the Suffrage Association. Now, you're no longer a Victorian woman, so I feel safe asking this question to you, but uh, you mentioned bloomers and how Amelia helped to popularize them. Can you describe exactly what they are? Yeah, um, honestly, um, as a child of the 1990s, I, my first thought was they kind of look like Princess Jasmine's pants. Uh, if that's a good reference for people. Uh, so they would be, they're also called Turkish trousers. Uh, so they were very wide leg pants uh, that gathered at the ankle. And um, this was for modesty stakes. Sometimes they were called a divided skirt uh, because they would be very wide. Um, so the goal was that, of course, you wouldn't want anyone to see the outline of your leg. That would be very inappropriate, but uh, you would have the movement that you, the, that you needed um, the ease of movement from having pants, but you would still be modestly, um, you know, hiding the out, outline of, of your legs. And I say modestly, but there was still, of course, a lot of people that found it to be immodest to be wearing any kind of pants for a lady, even if they were wide-legged. I do enjoy the idea of a jazz and pant. That made me yeah, laugh. yeah. <laughs> um, so one thing that happened, you talked about Amelia's life, is basically the reoccurrence of print media in her life coming up with newspapers and um, different things. So how did print media help spread the message about suffrage? So things like through the Lily or other news outlets. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very valuable research resource for her, especially when she first started out um, because it allowed her to share those ideas um, without people judging her either personally or, um, you know, for being a, a woman or for um, not being able to travel the way we can today. I mean, she's not gonna be able to hop on a plane and just go talk or write wherever she wants. So uh, I think it allowed her, number one, to present her ideas in an anonymous way. So, you know, no one would be coming at her or attacking her for uh, these reform ideas. And it allowed her to spread those ideas uh, beyond, you know, just being able to ha either have people over at her house for a talk or to talk, speak at a church or, you know, a, a hall in town. Uh, so I think that's why it was significant for her to have those, those newspapers, uh, both uh, through her husband publishing her work or submitting it to other papers and then her own newspaper. And our next question comes from Megan, um, and she says, it's interesting the level of overlap between the temperance movement and women's suffrage movement. Do you think the link of these movements delayed the passage of the 19th Amendment? Um, 
Not necessarily. Uh, and I guess I'll kind of take that in two sections. Uh, I think it is a well accepted idea at this point in time that both the abolition movement and the temperance movement um, was where a lot of suffragists, you know, cut their reform teeth, if you will. Uh, and they started wholeheartedly into these movements to try to abolish slavery or to try to abolish the, you know, drinking of alcohol. And uh, I should add that temperance started not as a way to eliminate the drinking of alcohol, but as just to make sure people were only doing it in moderation and then that changed. But um, as, I, as I kind of touched upon, uh, women wanted to become very active in these groups, but they had a difficult time being taken seriously, um, being given their fair share of work. And so I think in some way it kind of became the idea that you had to get your rights for yourself before you could work to seek or secure the rights of others um, so that they were taken seriously first at their value as women. Uh, so what they were saying about abolition or temperance could be taken seriously as well. And uh, to be honest, I would say uh, in terms of it delaying the 19th amendment, personally, I don't think so. I'm sure that there are people that could come up with a, an educated argument as to why it might be. But from this particular um, research for the personage of Amelia and her experiences, I would almost say that her suffrage work or her work for women's rights almost uh, stopped people from taking the temperance stuff seriously because um, even if people could get behind not drinking alcohol, regardless of whether they were a man or a woman, um, especially like with the bloomers, you know, it, people ridiculing that. And then, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony stepping away from, from that sort of dress as a distraction. Um, fewer people agreed with suffrage than agreed with temperance um, in the readings I've done. So that was... Um, something that people had to uh, figure out uh, in terms of their, their beliefs and um, what could be reconciled. And we touched upon the 19th Amendment passage uh, briefly there, but as you know, Amelia Bloomer and many of the people who were the founders of the suffrage movement did not see the passage of the 19th Amendment. How do you think Amelia would feel about where women are in today's society? Uh, I think she would be really excited. Um, she, she was a prolific writer, especially later in her life when her health um, didn't permit her to travel. Um, and of course, um, Iowa, even into the, the time she had lived there for a few decades, travel was more difficult than it was out east. Um, so she, she wrote a lot and her husband actually ended up compiling, editing and publishing her papers after she died. Uh, but she wrote to people and said that she may not live, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, it's not a direct quote, but um, she had no doubt that um, the women of the future would be able to capitalize and enjoy, uh, you know, reap the rewards and benefits of the work that she and other suffragists had put in. Um, and apparently later in her life, in an interview, she would ask if she would actually vote once, uh, once women received the vote or if they were to vote. And she told the interviewer that she thought that was a really strange question that, um, why she would not vote um, herself when she had spent all of her time doing that. And uh, so she said she definitely would vote and she did actually get to see women voting, not on the federal level, but um, women in Colorado were given the vote um, shortly before she died. Uh, so she at least did get to live in a world where women were voting, even if it was on a very limited scale. And she was very happy about that. So I think she would have been pleased so thank you to Kate again. Um, we really appreciate having you with us today and talking about Emily Bloomer. And thank you to the educators and students that signed up to be part of History Live with Women. If you have any questions about this or any of our educational programs, uh, please send us an email at museum.education.io.gov. Thanks again and have a good day.